Good morning, everyone. This is Donbass Media Forum, which is held for the seventh time in a row. We are organizing this event for all those journalists who are interested in Donbass, in peaceful negotiations, humanitarian, in the East and in the Crimea. This is the unique opportunity to get together once a year, every year, to discuss all those issues. My name is Alexei Matsuka. I am a co-founder of Donbass Media Forum. We are located in this wonderful studio of Hromatska TV. And let us start our discussion today. Let me start with uh, providing short talking points, uh, short introduction where we are and why we are organizing this event today. Starting from 2015, after the first uh, relocation, journalists from Luhansk and Donetsk Oblast have been organizing this event for the colleagues from the regions, for IDPs, journalist IDPs, and all those media experts that work with uh, the situation in Donbass. This forum gives us the opportunity to discuss issues related to the profession in the region and to, gap, to, to bridge uh, the gaps in our community. So our participation here today, our presence here today means that our fight goes on and our forum is a bright example of this fight. Every year we invite uh, employees of uh, the uh, editor's offices, media managers from top uh, media outlets in Ukraine and ab abroad. Today we traditionally will have a discussion, will exchange our opinions. We are here safe and secure and uh, we respect each other. It's not a secret that today our journalistic community faces many challenges. There are problems with freedom of speech in some parts of Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast and in Crimea, which are the foundation for totalitarian regime which exists there. Uh, second, there is a contraction of the market for content in our region. Starting from 2014, these events which are happening in the east of the country have changed all the processes and have changed the media situation in our country. Second, this is politicization of the content instead of making instead of paying attention to humanitarian issues. The mass media forum will help us uh, implement in life the idea of safe dialogue. Unfortunately, social media provoke other types of communication. In most cases, journalists, especially those who write on difficult topics, they confront, uh, confront internet bullying all over the social media. Uh, there are some uh, facts that some social media they uh, promote this kind of rhetorics. Our community of journalists that that care for themselves and for the others are real value to our Ukrainian society. Within these past few years we have understood that it is very important because we need to build this community, community of those who respect each other, who are ready to hear and understand each other. This is exactly what we and I personally value in Donbass Media Forum. During these two days we will discuss our safety and security media regulation that we demand from the state, the influence of politics on our activities, on how to stop disinformation, on uh, how journalists work in exile. We will also discuss uh, different stories of our journalists, of our colleagues, how we help them to carry out the work how our community can help them in this day-to-day -day hard work. Tomorrow I'll, I will be moderating a panel about the media landscape of uh, uh, Donbass uh, journalistic community. Are there any independent uh, media outlets left? How media try to survive and to build their business model? Uh, these two questions are cutting through the topic of our discussion today and tomorrow. Thanks to inclusiveness and uniqueness of the forum and to interdisciplinary approach which unites on one hand traditional journalists with programming, with design, with big data algorithms of social media and uh, search machines uh, with efficient management of uh, different organizations and uh, civil society initiatives. This forum will become an event which will let uh, all the participants to change uh, their outlook on the profession ethics and to get new knowledge. 
And in this short uh, intro, I would like to say that I uh, hotly anticipate to present you the topics of our discussion. The first uh, topic of our discussion is uh, responsibility uh, before the audience. What journalists must do to gain new audiences or to get uh, the audiences that have been lost? A uh, second general direction of our discussion is responsibility to the community of uh, our colleagues. This is very important. Which changes we have to initiate within the professional community to kickstart changes in the media sphere in Ukraine in general and in those of the Joint Forces operation in particular? third area of our discussion is uh, co-regulation and self-regulation. What are the ways to uh, regulate uh, the media? What, how do we use uh, this experience uh, to the, in those uh, who uh, work in the non-controlled areas? And next uh, area of our discussion is uh, education, self-education, efficient navigation using uh, the opportunities uh, to uh, to learn targeting, design, managing um, communities and initiative groups. Uh, these are four key directions of our discussion today. Uh, you can see them on the website and our forum in our Telegram channels uh, in on our pages in social media. As for the all uh, logistics uh, areas, you will be able to get in touch with uh, the organizing committee. On this, I would like to wrap up. I am happy to see all of you here in this studio. Good morning, happy to see you. And of course, we have our partners of the forum which have been with us for the past few years. They support our values, ideas, opinions. Unfortunately, not all of them could take part here physically because of the lockdown limitations. That is why we have a hybrid format online and offline. So we have our first, our first video from uh, from Marty Malsika, CEO Ambassador, Head of the EU Delegation to Ukraine. We also he have here with us two heads of uh, Donetsk Regional State Administration, Luhansk Regional State Administration. So, Serhii Haidan, Haidai from Luhansk Regional State Administration, Pavlo Karolenko from head of, head of Donetsk Regional State Administration. We also have with us Karin Rurke, Senior Pro Program Coordinator at OSCE, Project Coordinator in Ukraine. We also have here with us Taras Shevchenko, my dear colleague, and partner, Deputy Minister of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine. And also our guest is Press Officer U.S. Embassy, Daniel Langenkamp. Hello, greetings. And my colleague, friend on all projects that we are implementing in the framework of the DMF, that's Lubov Rakovice. Thank you all for uh, being here. You will all get a word. We will give floor to all of you. I hope that our audience is looking forward to hearing from you. And let's begin with uh, Mati Masikas. The floor is yours. Of the Donbass Media Forum. Although the COVID pandemic still does not allow us to meet in person, I am honored to greet you virtually. It is very symbolic that this year, the Donbass Media Forum takes place a few days after the Global Media and Information Literacy Week. According to the recent Media Literacy Index research presented by Detector Media, while 57% of Ukrainians believe that disinformation is a relevant problem for them, about 42% of Ukrainians never check information for its accuracy. And only about 8% of Ukrainians are considered to have high level of media literacy. In reality, all this allows a rise of disinformation narratives including dangerous anti-vaccination campaigns and Russian propaganda. That's why the EU continues to express our solidarity with the Ukrainian fact-checking organizations and media. We are working with many partners across the country to stimulate a sharper sense of urgency about disinformation and encourage critical media consumption and resistance to disinformation. 
overcoming these challenges also demands consistent development of objective and independent media outlets, especially a national public broadcaster. In this context, we welcome the progress that the Ukrainian broadcaster Suspilne demonstrates. This September, with the support of the European Union, Suspilne presented a new cross-platform multimedia newsroom. Modern production systems and equipment will help the audience receive high-quality news on websites, social media, TV and radio. The EU will continue and even increase its support to Suspilne as one of the pillars of independent journalism in Ukraine. However, its development will not be comprehensive under pressure from various domestic actors and restrictions of its funding. Only with the joint support of the state, civil society and the international community, Suspilne will contribute to a highly professional and truly pluralistic media landscape in Ukraine. That is one of the crucial tools that move Ukraine closer to the European Union in the broadest sense of the word. So, I wish you very productive discussions during these two days and let no viruses, informational or biological, stop you from using all the useful knowledge obtained during the forum. Thank you. Uh, indeed, I also hope that nothing will preclude us from talking about important topics and we shall speak already offline, uh, not only looking, watching it online. So now I would like to give floor to Oleksiy Haidai, who is the head of Luhansk um, Oblast administration we appreciate the participation of the state in this forum and most importantly we appreciate that you are from the region that you are head of Luhansk regional state administration and that you can now tell us here uh, and describe the situation in the east in our two regions for which Donbas Media Forum is held and then I would like to give floor to Mr. Karolenko okay thank you uh, thank you for the invitation for us having this chance to uh, communicate our opinion on such platform as well. You know, recently I had a meeting uh, with the students, pupils of the 10th and 9th grade and one of the questions that I was asked by the pupils of the school, what is it like to be the head of the uh, regional state administration. Well, in brief, that is to bear responsibility for all the processes that happen. And uh, for me and my colleague, it's a lot more complicated than our colleagues in other oblasts, because we have also the, because we have, we are at war. Uh, half an hour ago, I received information that right now there is a shelling between the Shastya and Turhizminka, which are two settlements. And uh, such things, thank God, are unknown to other, our other colleagues. But what is happening uh, from the point of view of the information, po informational policy, I recently marked second anniversary of my cadency and I can tell you that for two years there was a big breakthrough in Donetsk and Luhansk Oblasts from the point of view of refurbishment, repairs, improving infrastructure, but still today we can state the fact that we are losing the information war even now because this year we have opened and launched the highest TV tower 150 meters it has certain capacity for the 50 um, uh, kilometers uh, in the area to spread radio waves up to the border with the russian federation but so much money that uh, russia Fe russian federation uh, you know invests in the information war in the propaganda i think we are in different uh, you know definitely in different uh, le on different levels. When I, I pass by the contact line, I hear anything. I hear the radio, the uh, Red Star, Red Army, whatever, but not our radio waves. Uh, because uh, they are either very few of them or they are just uh, shut down. 
So let's take a look. Under the motto fighting the pandem pandemic, they have closed uh, 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 all of the uh, Stanitsa Luhanska, uh, so of the checkpoints, and Stanitsa has been closed too. This was the only possibility for people uh, on the eighth year of propaganda when crossing from the temp te temporarily occupied territory to the controlled by Ukraine territory so that they could see with their own eyes the changes, not just in the words, not on TV, and that it's not some Ukrainian rhetoric that has nothing inside but then, but then just go through the checkpoint and they see roads kindergartens schools centers of administrative services uh, hospitals and they can see that with their own eyes and see the better changes or changes for better but still the Netsk and Luhansk oblast even when there was an economic race they were not very well financed and not so much attention was paid to these oblasts but now all people see that the changes are happening and before pandemic um, via uh, Stanitsa Luhanska 15,000 people passed through this checkpoint if all of the checkpoints functioned I think that together with Luhansk oblast so together Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast we would uh, let at least 50,000 people pass and they could see those changes with their own eyes and then going back to the temporarily occupied territory we would have this the work of uh, you know th them telling about these changes uh, spreading the news so to say they would uh, tell about these things to their relatives and then propaganda wouldn't be so powerful and the same uh, now russian federation is also trying to to break this connection with us so such platforms like this one is giving us one more additional opportunity to communicate our message thank you um thank you pavlo karelenko head of donetsk regional state administration okay thank you well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, co-founders for invitation. I'm very pleased to be here for the third year in the row to this event, a very important project. And that I can participate in important um, discussions. And I'm sure that this year, that this is going to be like a tradition where professionalism and awareness of all of the participants of the panel discussions different other online discussions that they will be they will aim and they will achieve this aim that's fighting disinformation that is constructive dialogue fruitful discussions and no matter how acute they are they are based on the basic principles that we are even you know promoting today because we know the risks of disinformation which is uh, constructive const constructivity professionalism and providing verified information no matter how maybe difficult it is so that is why today I am, as my colleague mentioned, Serhi Haidai, we both are ready to discussions of the development of the regions, of some problematic issues in our regions, maybe political issues in the regions, if um, uh, such questions will be raised. But most importantly, is it's something that I have always uh, said, the volume of work that is done in all directions, it gives the possibility to me to speak and follow my life principles, which are open and clearly and with understanding that information and actions that follow after this information, they might not be to everyone's liking, but most importantly is to bear responsibility for um, the f f t for this uh, for its uh, true nature and so i would like to thank you one more time for the invitation i'm ready for the discussions fruitful discussions and the only thing i, I can wish us all is so that uh, such initiatives that that this one initiative is already seven years and that this kind of initiatives i want them to be uh, only progressing and indeed the 
audience of professionals with understanding of their case and matter would only go higher. Uh, thank you, Pavlo. Yes, you will participate in the panel discussions. We appreciate uh, very much your deep involvement to those processes in which uh, journalists participate. And now I would like to give floor to Taras Shevchenko, Deputy Minister, uh, who is also an old friend of Donbas Media Forum and your Ministry of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine also uh, dedicates a lot of attention to those questions which are in the agenda of the journalists. Thank you all. Greetings to all of you. Indeed, all of the questions that make agenda of this DMF are very relevant and they are very uh, reasonable starting with the word responsibility not in the context of the legal responsibility but a responsibility to the audience we recently uh, uh, celebrated on the state level the day of responsibility of a human being that has been initiated uh, in the anniversary of the birthday and is connected with the text written by Bogdan Havrilishin and the word responsibility or responsible person is in the mission of the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy. That is why if journalists, if the level of their responsibility to the audience and to each other is, only, is going to increase, that's only going to be to the benefit of the freedom of speech and democracy. Self-regulation, amalgamation is also a very relevant topic. Uh, but unfortunately in, in these topics not so much progress that we can observe our ministry want to have powerful networks of journalists who have powerful self-regulation because this can decrease the need by the state to intervene into any relationship and to set any laws or rules you mentioned the social network that is but doing something harmful potentially harmful they also have the discussion about the self-regulation within the network maybe there is a necessity of setting some higher laws because there's an assumption that self-regulation is that something that they're doing so well speaking of journalist organization the question i would ask ask in which organization journalists from the best media outlets with the highest reputation those media outlets which are called NV or Liga or journalists of Suspilne, in which journalist organization they are talking to each other, so what kind of journalist organization they belong to, with whom they discuss all these questions related to self-regulation ethics, are there any organizations like that? If there are no such organization, then for the past 20 years as a lawyer in the media area, I have been studying this issue. There was only one attempt, quite a proactive journalistic attempt, to create an independent media union as a platform for discussion, for high quality discussion. But I don't remember any other attempts. I've heard many times that we tried, we failed, we don't need it anymore. But it's quite a strange position because something failed at first. I think there is a high need to do that and I am happy that we are going to discuss this issue later today. Uh, there, are, there shall be more attempts to create such a community. Uh, there is a need uh, of the journalist community but it shall not be done by the state. It shall be done by the journalists themselves. The state can help with some kind of legal uh, framework. However, self-regulation is the task of the journalist. To end with, I would like to tell you that it was uh, oh, I was very happy to hear such topics as f uh, fighting fake news or disinformation because these are two strategic areas of our work also at the ministry we have a media literacy week which happened uh, just last week and uh, the fight uh, of uh, disinformation it going on. I disagree that we lose in this for. Unfortunately, we won't be able to have uh, uh, budgets like our opponents. However, not only money does matter. Thank you so much. We are starting our first discussion and the question is, do we win or do we lose in this uh, disinformation war? But in any case, it is obvious that there are many topics for discussion. And let me give it over to Karen Rurke, Senior Program Coordinator at OEC Project Coordinator in Ukraine. Your organization 
has been uh, cooperating with uh, Donbass Media Forum for many years in, the, in a row. For our community it matters a lot, because those principles that OSCE uses now, I mean a uh, special monitoring mission, are also near and dear to us. I mean, from the point of view of monitoring and collection of uh, information. So, Karen, uh, the floor is yours. I am in this studio and be able to take part in the opening of the Donbass Media Forum. Um, it is worth recognizing and praising the efforts of the organizers to do all things possible to make this event um, happening, uh, despite all the challenges uh, that are posed by COVID-19. Because these challenges do highlight the importance of public trust in media, and this forum is a perfect place to look for, uh, to look and, uh, for ways um, on how to enhance trust. In crisis situations, people are looking for information they can rely on. However, in today's world of social media, they are tempted to draw on shadow channels, exploiting fear and promoting conspiracy. We see how detrimental this can be to efforts to combat the pandemic. There are no simple solutions to this problem. But I do believe that good journalism can be a strong ally in overcoming disinformation. Independent media provides a platform where expression of different opinions can lead to mutual, mutual understanding on how to solve problems. I encourage all the forum participants through discussions to challenge and inspire and support each other to find ways on how to deal with current and also old challenges. The OECE um, is supporting several discussion plat platforms for this year's forum. One of them will provide the possibility to brainstorm on how media can help reduce growing polarization in society. The other reviews challenges of gender sensitive reporting, a sphere where ethical journalism is crucial for dispelling stereotypes. And we also encourage dialogue between community and authorities on regulatory approaches. Keeping the balance between freedom of media and the needs to defend public interest is never outdated. This is the real meaning of journalistic self-regulation through dialogue, establish does and don'ts, share best practices and ensure that people have growing confidence in the media as a source of reliable information especially in crisis times. So I wish all participants a very fruitful and self-regulatory discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, uh, Thank you so much, Karen, for your inspired words. Of course, it is very important uh, to uh, discuss these issues uh, during uh, the uh, media forum. We also have with us Daniel Lenhenkamp from the U.S. Embassy. Daniel, we are also happy to uh, see you here today. For many years, uh, the U.S. Embassy have been cooperating with the DMF as a partner. We really value your cooperation and we think that it gives us the opportunity for carrying out our professional duties. This cooperation gives us uh, the opportunity to grow, to develop and strengthen our values. So please, over to you. So thank you, I'm happy to be here today and I will switch to English. To the journalists that are in our audience here. So I used to be cool. Um, that is to say, I used to be like the journalists that are here. Um, I used to be a reporter, and one of my favorite stories from the time when I was a reporter was when I was a freelancer. In July of 2000, 21 years ago, I drove down from Hungary, where I was based, uh, to Srebrenica in Bosnia uh, to, to report on the first Muslims that had returned to Srebrenica five years after the massacre there. And for those that don't remember the massacre in Srebrenica, 
It was a situation where there was an enclave during the war. Um, Bosnian Serbs rounded up the men and boys of the area, um, put them in buses, shot them, buried them in shallow graves, and then expelled all of the Muslims from the area, from that enclave. Five years later, there was a peace deal in Bosnia, uh, and the first Muslims began to return. A huge victory for the Bosnian people and for the international community. So I went down to report on that, on those, uh, those Muslims that were, that were returning. I drove down in my own car. It was a crappy Mazda 323 that would overheat every time I would go up a hill. And if you know the Balkans, it's hilly. I didn't have an, even an email from my editors because we didn't have email back then. And as insurance, I put four $50 bills in my shoes in case I got into a sticky situation. Um, to make a long story short, my car did overheat as I was going up a hill in a very sticky spot. Uh, one of the most hostile parts of uh, Republika Srpska. I, a police stopped me. He looked at me, tried to figure out what I was doing, and he let me go. I got to do the story. I went back to Hungary. Everything was fine. But nowadays, when I look back at that story, I often think about what could have gone wrong. They could have arrested me. They could have accused me of being a spy. They could have thrown me in jail. They could have tortured me. They could have forced me to conf confess in some poorly, state TV, some poor, poorly lit state TV studio uh, with a bunch of thugs standing by. Uh, I didn't think about that story very much until I became a diplomat. And I began to work with people that reminded me so much of myself 21 years ago getting paid too little to take too many risks to work for publications that weren't big enough to write stories that not enough people read. But that is what journalists do. I tell this story and I think of all of you out there in the field today who are just like I was. Nobody knows what huge risks journalists take to do their jobs, to get us information that society needs to make informed decisions to hold leaders and criminals accountable, and to be the best democracy that we can be. And when I think of this story, I think of all those reporters who faced exactly the nightmare scenario that I actually avoided. So when I worked for Reuters, I worked with, distantly, a legend in our company named Kurt Shork. He was a guy who at 43 decided to become a journalist after working for the New York Transit, Metropolitan Transit Authority. And he was a notorious reporter for his powerful reporting, people-centered reporting in the Balkans. He was later shot in the head in Sierra Leone in an ambush by rebels. And while I was in Bosnia, I was there because I was reporting for the Christian Science Monitor. And the reporter whose beat I was covering was named David Rode. He was a reporter who won the Pulitzer Prize working for this paper. And he was the reason that my paper cared about me going down there and cared about this story. David, who won the Pulitzer, again, for his reporting in Afghanistan, uh, later was held and kidnapped by the Taliban for nine months. And he escaped, but he faced that nightmare scenario. Most of all, in my work now, I think of Stanislav Aseyev in the Donbass, who was held for 19 months by Russian proxies. I think of Vladislav Yasupenko in Crimea, who's being held unjustly by Russian authorities there. I think of Raman Pratasevich in Belarus, forced to confess with hands that are clearly swollen and a bruised face in a poorly lit TV studio with thugs standing by. I think of all of us, I think all of us know something about the courage of all of these reporters, their idealism, the heroism that they embody, even if they never thought that they were signing up for anything like this. False accusations, torture, confession, and conviction. All of this goes to say that few of us really understand, I think, how dangerous reporting is in the public. They don't understand that, especially in zones of conflict, especially in countries with high levels of corruption, where there are challenges with rule of law. And the funny thing about reporters is that while they do think about these risks, they go ahead and do their work because 
these risks um, are not as important as getting the story out. The truth is I would have done most of my work voluntarily because, because I loved it so much. Now, while I moved on from uh, being a journalist to making foreign policy, doing foreign policy as a diplomat, there's not a day when I don't miss being a reporter, actually. I miss the adventure, the ability to learn about things that no one else knows, and to be a voice in this society reporting on the truth. So when I tell, talk about this story, let me tell you that I, I, that, that I am your friend in the US Embassy. Um, and a friend who knows a little bit of what it's like to be you, a freelancer or a stringer like Stan or Vlad, risking everything for a story that you must tell the, war, uh, tell the world. But let me say more than that. Let me also say that it, in the entire U.S. Embassy, we care. Uh, the U.S. government as a whole is dedicated to a free and independent media in our hearts because a free and independent media has been such an important part of our, our U.S. history. We think about the Pentagon Papers, we think about Watergate, we think about Vietnam, we think about reporters like Walter Cronkite and the role they've had in our history. Um, so that causes you know, us to really appreciate what the free press is. And while journalists cause us a lot of headaches, we know what an invaluable asset they are to our society. And that's why we support the Donbass Media Forum and other media throughout U Ukraine. What you are engaged in as reporters, and I say this to you, Alex, and all the reporters in the audience, um, is a struggle not only for a free Donbass, um, but a struggle for the prosperity and the future of the Ukrainian people, um, and for your friends, neighbors, and community who have been unfairly isolated amidst this aggression. So, I want everyone to know that the United States will continue to do everything possible to help you in this struggle and to do what, uh, what Stan Asiev says, is keep this dream of a free Donbass alive. Um, this includes not just supporting this forum, but also the, the, the support for media organizations around Ukraine. Um, we provide millions of dollars in assistance to, to help the free media. It also includes supporting journalists in fighting against Russian disinformation, the scourge that we all know about, the support for free journalism in the controlled ter territories, Donbass and Crimea, and support for journalists' rights and safety while they get the truth out about the conflict out. So translated into concrete action, this does mean financial assistance, but it also means our political support for, for people that have been unjustly imprisoned and for advocating for free press and for independence of the media. So does that mean we're going to support all organizations? No, of course not. Organizations need to be independent, independent even of us and their financial donors if they're really going to be independent. Um, but that does mean that when reporters get in their cars with little more than a few dollars tucked into their shoes and a laptop as insurance, uh, that the United States is there with them in spirit, with you in spirit, uh, supporting your critical role in society, making Ukraine freer, more democratic, and more prosperous. Thanks. Дякуємо. Thank you very much. Дуже цікава доповідь насправді. Дуже. Thank you so much. Such an interesting uh, report, but also separate a thank. Thanks to you for rem remembering Vladislava Sepenka that has been. Um, uh, also imprisoned in Crimea and uh, Protasevich in Belarus. It's a good reminder to all of us about work of our colleagues where they are when where they have to face arrest prosecution only for just doing their professional work. Such professional work is also done by the Donetsk Institute of Information. This is the organization that is implementing forum for many years and is in the unique situation working including in the non-controlled uh, territories collecting everyday news from there and also reporting news there and organizing very difficult processes on highlighting the situation in the east and Lubov who is the representative of our Donetsk Institute of Information and uh, she's the chairperson of this NGO 
and she is also the head of the forum organizing committee and me as a moderator i give the final speech to luba yes greetings um, to all of our guests in the studio and also our uh, uh, viewers online on their seventh media forum donbass media forum we always every year as a team of the forum we set tasks ahead of us to gather journalists experts and other uh, our partners to discuss the situation in donbass and also very important and relevant issues that rise in front of the journalistic community who unite around the topic of conflict in the east of Ukraine. But of course that uh, the good quality professional journalists, journalism and such things as freedom of speech and new tools for effective work of the editorial office, these are common values. Our Donbass Media Forum every year is a kind of a platform for for experts of the media sphere to discuss their urgent issues and gain new knowledge for further uh, effective work. Before pandemic, this could also be arranged offline and it was a big platform for meetings face-to-face uh, -face for exchange of the latest news from the fields, from the ground and new acquaintances and we hope a lot that further on we shall be able to do this again and again and this gives us the inspiration to everyday hold on bus media forum for all these years our forum has been visited by almost 2,000 participants and last year up to 20,000 of viewers joined us online so I'm greeting you at the seventh Donbass media forum and I'm encouraging you to be active to join our discussions both in the studio and online ask questions and be strong yes so greetings uh, thank you luba thank you dear colleagues uh, we uh, are a bit uh, you know over the time but that's normal when the discussions take place so I would like to also uh, speak to all of our participants and viewers, both men and women. We invite you to all of the events which we offer within the forum. So, dear colleagues, thank you so much for the opening, for such this honor, honorable mission that you have just fulfilled here for our audience. And this whole thing has been recorded and this is going to be watched both online and after the forum. And I hope that this seventh DMF is going to have a historic role in the general case of uh, bringing back Ukraine, uh, uh, you know, to having only controlled uh, territories and bringing back those uncontrolled territories home and help those people who are there giving them the signal we are waiting for them at home and ukraine is open for everyone who lives now in crimea or in donbas and there isn't a single you know concern not on the side of the stakeholders or politicians or public activists uh, you know f for ukraine to be um, you know to be a, a un unity so thank you for your time and I'm inviting you to visit next panel discussions.